Well, we're starting a new series on the church, <clears throat> and as I was thinking even today uh, of sharing with you about the church, I thought of the uh, words in the New Testament that someday it says every one of us will stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and the things we've done uh, for him will be preserved, and God will bless as a result, and of course, uh, the things that we didn't do, we will be, of course, feel terrible on that day where we stand before Christ. Now, <clears throat> the judgment seat of Christ is different than the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment is where people are, are doomed for hell. They'll stand before God and they'll have to give account. But Christians, too, will stand before God and give an account of what we did with our gifts. And so if, if you consider that, what have I done with what God has given me? Uh, there's a serious uh, responsibility that God gives the church, and so we have to look at it pretty seriously, what we're doing with that. <clears throat> and so today, as we talk about the church, last week uh, we established that Jesus is the rock. He is the cornerstone uh, we looked at different Bible verses from the Old Testament and New that established that Jesus is the rock, the cornerstone of the church. And it says, we are the small pebbles or the other stones that make this huge spiritual temple where Christ is also the head of the church, right? The spiritual church. We are his hands and feet. We are to minister to others. And so we've talked about him being, of course, the head of the church, and that, that uh, back in the first century, he gave a commission to his disciples, and he told them what they needed to do, and they were faithful. They were faithful unto death. They were faithful, the majority of them being martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. And so now what does it mean for us in the 21st century Living in Duluth, Hermantown, Proctor, Esco area. What does it mean for us? Turn with me if you have your Bibles to Acts 1 verse 8. <clears throat> Acts, first chapter, verse 8. Now, Acts is the history book of the New Testament. <clears throat> it tells us all about the church, about how it got started, how it grew the problems they encountered, and all of the different things that happened in the first century church. And so Acts 1, <clears throat> verse 8, well, why don't we pick it up, verse 6. So when the apostles were with Jesus, this is after the resurrection, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore your kingdom? And they were excited about that. He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, through Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men uh, suddenly stood before them, or among them, men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here <clears throat> staring into the heavens? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of half a mile or so, when they arrived, they went to upstairs to the upper room where they were staying, and they prayed. And there were about 120 believers or so uh, that gathered together, uh, the apostles and the different ladies that followed Jesus, the women that loved him so much. And they waited till the day of Pentecost that comes in the next chapter, and that's when the Holy Spirit fell upon the church in an amazing way, and they were all baptized in the Holy Spirit, began to speak in these different languages that were praising God. <clears throat> and there were people from all over in Jerusalem for the festival, and they, they thought they were drunk. What are you guys doing? And, and all of a sudden, 
uh, Peter comes to the plate and he shares an unbelievable message that that day thousands of people gave their life to Jesus Christ. Thousands. You talk about a revival and the church was growing every day because they had the Holy Spirit in their lives and they were faithful to the message. It's very important that we understand that. He said, go start right here in Jerusalem. Start right where you're at. Start in college. Start in your high school. Start in your home. No matter where you're at, you are to be my witness of what I've done in your life. So start where you're at. Don't look to go to the Middle East. Don't look to go to Africa. Don't look to go to India or Japan. You are to be my witnesses right here, and I'll lead you. And so how exciting that God has a plan for every believer, every Christian believer. <clears throat> and so it's a great plan. And in Matthew 28, we see a little more about this plan. And we've looked at this scripture many times. Uh, and, and it's about time that all of us begin to apply it to our life. <clears throat> Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Uh, Jesus and the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountains where Jesus had uh, told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some of them still doubted. <clears throat> Amazing how that doubt can be in our minds sometimes, right? You ever doubt God when you pray? And you ever doubt his ability? You ever doubt things happening? Uh, that's part of the human nature. But God wants us to be people of faith. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have given you all authority in heaven and earth. Or I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. <clears throat> Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Those are the words you need to hear today. Go and make what? Disciples, disciples of all nations. And he was talking to you and to me. Then he said, Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you. So he's given us our, our directives here. <clears throat> Teach them, baptize them, teach them uh, to obey everything I've commanded you. And be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So here we see the commission. <clears throat> we see that Jesus left the church with this great directive and now it was up to the church to do something and as you read church history which is really interesting you'll see uh, certainly there were some dark ages and and there were some hard times but throughout the ages there were faithful people that loved the Lord and that continued with this mission uh, we we uh, we've seen that there's been wars in the name of Jesus there's been uh, the church has done wrong things but <clears throat> when we do it the way God tells us to do it, we will be willing not just to live to, for Christ, but to die for him. And certainly we do that to bring the wonderful good news to other people. So, so here we are. Make disciples of all nations. Make disciples. How do we do that? How do we make disciples? When should it start? How can, we, how can we mold people? How can we get them uh, to truly <clears throat> follow Christ? Well, uh, there's certainly different things that we need to do. In order to disciple somebody, you need to befriend them, don't you? And, and it starts with a relationship. It starts with a relationship, and I think it's so important. I remember uh, when I was a junior in high school and I went to Camp Siegel, and uh, Christian camps are so wonderful, and at the camp, I, I uh, prayed with different young people to receive Christ that were there from all over the state, got to know them, and, and shared with them. And at the end of every camp, the night before we left, they had a testimony service <clears throat> where we did, you'd had a bonfire, and you'd take a, a pine branch, and you'd bring it up, and you would share your little testimony, and then throw the branch in the fire, and walk away. That was the ritual that we had. <clears throat> I remember the testimonies were very similar uh, as, we, as I went to that camp from 
after I got saved when I was in eighth grade, I went there every year. Even when we got married, we went there to counsel, my wife and I, uh, after we got married. And I remember this, these words coming out of the mouths of my peers. Last year, I came to camp, and I gave my heart to Jesus, and then I went home, and I went back to school, and I fell away. Those were the words I heard year after year after year. I fell away. <clears throat> the Bible has a lot of warnings about falling away. But why were they falling away? And I remember thinking uh, how important it is to continue. You, you make a commitment to Christ, that's just the beginning. And, and I thought, I go home, and when I went back home, it was darkness. I want to tell you, it was dark. And anybody know what I'm talking about in a dark setting? There's a lot of people living around us that we have no clue. They may have beautiful homes, but they walk in and it's dark. It's, a, it's, it's gloom. It's negative. And, and I remember that, and certainly I didn't look forward to going back home. It was a depressing atmosphere. <clears throat> My mother uh, smoking, the house filled with smoke. I can still see the, the rays of sun coming through the curtains and the house filled with smoke and, and depression and all of the things you dealt with. But God was there in the midst of that. And so coming to Christ, certainly uh, we're going to have problems and everything doesn't just get better right away, believe me. Anyone know that? <clears throat> just, it's just not automatic where everything gets better. And so, so here I... I had a burden for those young people that prayed, and I remember I got some studies together. Lynn helped me with it. Uh, Lynn is the one that led me to Christ, <clears throat> and I went down to St. Paul, and I started a Bible study with some of the kids that got saved at camp. I went to Hill City uh, that summer and started trying to see these new Christians get established in their walk with God and the importance of going to church and, and the importance of reading their Bible and the importance of passing it on. Now, if we did what this told us to do, friends, we would have revival on our hands. How do we do it, though? And that's, that's so very important. It's one thing to read it. It's another thing to apply it to our daily lives. So what do we do here? Well, <clears throat> we're going to look uh, at a situation in history where Paul the Apostle, and you know that Paul, uh, certainly he was a religious man, but he wasn't a Christian. He didn't believe in Jesus. He persecuted the church. He was there at the first martyr, Stephen's, uh, when he was killed for his faith, condoning what was going on, and then he saw light from heaven. That changed his life forever. He heard the voice of Jesus. Similar to us. Maybe you didn't see a light. But we saw Jesus who is the light. We heard his voice. We responded to his word. We made a commitment to follow him. And so the church. Right now we're in the same situation. Where Jesus said go into all the world. And make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So the question is, for you and for me, are we doing that? Or are we so busy with life that there's no time to do that wonderful thing that God told us to do, fulfill the Great Commission? Are we doing it? And believe me, someday we will stand before Christ and give account to what he told us to do. Just like if you have a review at your job. Are you doing your job? And, and listen, he's our commander-in-chief. We have, we have been so graciously, by God's grace, been brought into the family of God. But it's not just to get our fire insurance. It's we have a job to do. We have a job to do. And this is our job description right here. To go and make disciples of all nations. So who are you doing that with? How does it happen? 
Uh, Paul uh, had, <clears throat> I believe, three missionary journeys. And as Paul went on uh, his first missionary journey, uh, he went all over. But uh, Paul, in his travels, and I, I, I believe it probably happened on his first missionary journey, he, he met a family in Lystra, and, and he got to know them. And uh, he probably at the time, it was just a young kid that maybe heard Paul speak, and he gave his heart to Jesus. Paul goes back there on his second missionary journey, and we see that he meets Timothy, and probably, probably for the second time, because Timothy uh, became his son in the faith. And when you look at son in the faith, you would think that Paul led him to the Lord and fathered him. And so <clears throat> turn with me to Acts chapter 16. And we're going to look and see how did this happen with Paul? How did, how did Paul uh, disciple others? Certainly he, he focused their attention to Jesus and his teachings, right? And to the church and the importance of being involved. Acts 16, and let's uh, start with verse 1. Paul went uh, to Der Derbe and then to Lystra, where there was a young disciple named Timothy. His mother was a Jewish believer, but his father was a Greek. Lois and Eunice were Timothy's uh, mother and grandmother. His father was a Greek. He probably was not a, a believer at that time. <clears throat> Timothy was well thought of by the believers in Lystra and Iconium. So Paul wanted him to join them on the journey. In deference to the Jews of the area, he arranged for Timothy to be circumcised before they left, for everyone knew that his father was a Greek. Then they went from town to town, instructing the believers to follow the decisions made by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in their faith and grew larger every day. So we'll stop there. Here we see Paul built a relationship with the young man. It doesn't tell us how long he was there. It doesn't tell us how many dinners they had together. It doesn't tell us uh, uh, on the encounter with Lois and Eunice and how they went from Jewish believers to disciples of Jesus, but they did so as a result of the apostles, and Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. They heard the message of God, and they began to follow Jesus. Timothy, at this time, was only a teenager. He was just a young teenager, and he must have had, believe me, if you're going to get circumcised for some, some reason, there, Paul must have built a friendship because that's not fun. And so, so Paul must have already built a relationship with this young man to such a point that he said, if this is going to help the Jewish believers so I can minister to them, I'll go ahead and get circumcised. And then they went on their journey. Just a teenager. I want to tell you something. Don't look down upon the youth. And that's what Paul said. Don't let people despise your youth, Timothy. Listen, our young people, God can use them in mighty ways. Mighty ways. He can use us old people too. And so God wants all of us to be used. And what, used in what way? Well, here we see that Paul, first of all, established a friendship a relationship. Uh, maybe it's going to Starbucks, getting to know somebody. Maybe it's being with them at work, spending time together, going on a fishing trip. Um, all of these things. We need to get to know each other. We need to befriend people that don't know Christ. And we need, the Bible says, make Christianity attractive. Some Christians walk around. Right? You're a Christian, yeah. And they, they, they make it look like, well, boy, it doesn't look very attractive. I wouldn't want to be a Christian if you, you didn't never seem happy. Christians, we should be the ones living life to the full. 
We have an abundant life, Jesus said. I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. We, we really know what life is all about. I did a funeral yesterday afternoon uh, at the, at the uh, graveside and <clears throat> committal service, and it was so beautiful for Roger Young's mother. Uh, and his mother, Esther, uh, was 97, and, but she loved the Lord. And to hear the stories of her love for people, what a heritage, what a heritage. God wants you to love people. How are we going to do it? Uh, get involved. Uh, get involved in other people's lives. We talked about it, but Paul went, got involved in Timothy's life. Timothy watched him and then began to follow him. Uh, discipleship is so very, very important. And uh, what a wonderful <clears throat> ripple effect it makes. Turn with me as we see this. Uh, two things happened. <clears throat> they went out, they trained them, they discipled them, and as a result, the church did what? It grew. Just think, if every one of us took this seriously today, every one of us took it seriously. I just want you to think about it. We took it serious, and we realized, well, God wants me to be a disciple maker. He wants me to go with the Great Commission and he wants me to start right where I'm at, right? So, so, so we take it serious. And, and we, we all begin to pray about getting involved in other people's lives. And God, lead me to the people. It doesn't mean you're going to have ten people all of a sudden. You're, uh, we start with one, right? Paul started with, with that family right there in, in Turkey and Lystra. He started with that family. He got, he got uh, Eunice and Lois gave their hearts to the Lord. Timothy's with them. Young kid, yeah, I want to follow Jesus. I believe this. And all of a sudden, he's got a family that believes, and, and the other people are believing. And in this area, God begins to pour out his spirit in the different churches there, Galatia that Paul spent much time in there, Ephesus, and he's writing to these people in this area, and he needs other people to establish them. So he disciples Timothy. Why? He pours his heart into him. So Timothy, what's he going to do with this now? He's a Christian. Turn with me to uh, Timothy. Let's first, first of all, let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> this is Paul's letter later on to Timothy. Paul was in prison at the time, probably uh, either in Rome or uh, close to going to that area. And so he writes this letter to Timothy, who he had already discipled. And let's pick it up, 2 Timothy chapter 1. I want to just look at first. <clears throat> this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I have been sent out to tell others about the life he promised through faith in Christ Jesus. I am writing to Timothy, my dear son. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. Timothy, I thank God for you. The God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did night and day. I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted. And I will be filled with joy when we are together again. You can see the close relationship they had. I remember your genuine faith, for you, sh for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother, Lois. Paul was preaching there, and Lois gave her heart to the Lord. And your mother, Eunice. And I know the same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you, fan to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. 
So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. So here Paul is discipling Timothy. He gave, he gave Timothy this directive. He wanted him to establish the churches where he was at. Paul was going to go somewhere else. They had been on missionary journeys together. They had done a lot together. And so then in chapter 2, Paul goes on in his letter. This was just one long letter when Paul wrote it. It did not have verses. It did not have chapters. It was a letter to Timothy inspired by God through the Holy Spirit, of course. Then he says, Timothy, my dear son, in chapter 2, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Do you see how it works? Do, do you see how this works? Timothy, I pass this on to you, to your grandmother, to your mother. Now you pass it on to other faithful men. God is talking to us to find trustworthy, faithful people who will follow Christ to teach them so they will, in turn, do the same with others. And it's just like that ripple effect when you throw a, a rock into a pond and you see the ripples keep going. You never know where it's going to end, do you? You never know where that's going to end. And believe me, that ripple effect has gone all the way down it's, it's come across the oceans. It's come all the way here. It's lasted for over 2,000 years. The church is strong. God is working in the church. But friends, we have to keep doing our part. And if we don't do our part, we could be one generation away from extinction of the church that we know today. And so God wants us to do our part. So what is our part? To be disciple makers. How do we do it? We befriend people. We pour our life into them. We get to know them. We go to a soccer game. We go to a football game. We get to know them. They begin to trust you. Maybe they like you. That's important, right? We get an opportunity to share Jesus with them. Maybe they receive Christ. Maybe you invite them to church. They give their heart to the Lord. And then they begin to be discipled. Well, how do I disciple them, pastor? What do I do? What did Paul do? He poured his life into them. He spent time with them. He shared the truth with them. He shared the scriptures with them. What should we do? We should do the same thing. The same exact thing. So he said, I want you to do this. He said, I want you to, to do this and teach other faithful men. Then he goes on to say, very important words for the church, endorse suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in affairs of civilian life for they cannot please the officer who entrusted the, enlisted them if they do that. And athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. And hardworking farmers should be the first to enjoy the fruit of their labor. Think about what I'm saying. The Lord will help you understand all these things. So he's, he's telling them, you're in God's army. How many remember onward Christian soldiers, right? Uh, we've been enlisted as in God's army. And he said, don't get concerned with civilian affairs. Don't get so wrapped up in your life with stuff that you forget about your commission. And it's not a suggestion, the great suggestion. It's the great what? Commission. commission. So don't get so wrapped up in life that you forget about this commission. Don't get so wrapped up in your job that you think that's what it's all about. Listen, yes, you have to be workers. Christians, every time you go to work, you should work on to Christ. You should give it all you have and be the best employee there. But Jesus doesn't want us to get so involved in things that we forget our commission. And so here, he tells uh, Timothy that, and he says, always remember in verse 8, that Jesus Christ, a descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. Always remember, this is the good news that I preach and that we are to preach, the good news of what? The resurrection of Jesus, giving hope of eternal life to people. And because I preach this good news, I am suffering and have been chained like a criminal, but the word of God cannot be chained. 
So I'm willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God has chosen. Paul was really willing to go to jail just to help other people come to know Christ. Are we willing to give up our free time to befriend somebody, to love somebody, to pour our life into somebody so they can do the same? If we die with Christ, we shall also live with him. If we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. Remind everyone about these things. That's what I'm doing today. I'm reminding you about these things. What Paul told Timothy to do. What Timothy told others to do. And it went on and on and on. And because of that wonderful faithfulness of the early church, a young college student at UMD caught the same message. He got a vision. And he got that because a young man in North Carolina named Billy Graham, there was a preacher, and you don't even know his name, he came to preach, and Billy Graham went forward. You never know what God's going to do. But we have to pass it on to faithful men that will teach others also. So this man, Lynn Kern, <clears throat> who is now my brother-in-law, and most of you know the story, he goes to Urbana, Illinois. He hears Billy Graham preach, and he hears different missionaries, and they share, God wants to use you right where you're at. You start in where? Jerusalem. Right? You start in Hermantown. You start in Duluth, right where you're at. And this young man came home, a shy, reserved college student, becoming a teacher at UMD. And he says, God, I want you to use me right here in Duluth. He said, if you give me five junior high kids that will give their lives to Jesus by August 1st, I will pour my life into them. Give me five. And he prayed. Interesting. <clears throat> he was at First Presbyterian Church downtown. I had never met him in my life. <clears throat> he starts a friendship. Hey, want to play a game of horse? Sure, why not? So he played a game of horse. He invites me to a Bible study. I start getting inquisitive. He invites me back the next night. I come back. He invites me back the next night. And I have my friends coming with. And all of a sudden, God begins to do a work in my life. And I get down on my knees and I ask Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Discipleship. How do we do it? How did Paul do it? He poured his life into Timothy. What did Lynn do then? You see, here's a guy that was practicing it. By the way, those five kids grew to 20 kids and 30 kids. And by the end of that year, we had 70, 80 kids meeting every Thursday night down at First Press for a Bible study. God was moving in a wonderful way. In ninth grade, Lynn had me leading Bible studies. Why? How? Because he poured his life into me. See, disciple, making disciples is not just getting to somebody to say, okay, I'll pray and become a Christian. Making disciples is training them to understand our commission. When I went to Bible college, Lynn wrote that verse on a book that he gave me when I was going to Bible college, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Commit these things to faithful people who will go and teach others to do the same. 
Lynn gave me his telephone number. He lived with his mother down on 3rd Street. 728-3359. Okay, still got her. Call me anytime. I did. Too many times. His mother, I'd hear her say, it's that Thor kid again. <clears throat> He's at my home when I'm having problems. Lynn, could you come over? He was there. He started taking me to church. And I'd sit with him in church and I watched everything he did. Discipleship. Discipleship. I watched how he prayed. Always a hand on his nose. I thought that's how you prayed. Discipleship. Discipleship. He started pouring his life into my family. He was my mentor, my spiritual father, my friend. And then the bum starts dating my sister. I was so mad and so jealous. Instead of calling me, he's calling her. And now they've been married probably 45 going on 50 years. Serving the Lord. Discipleship. Go and make disciples of all nations. Pour your life into people. It's these things that will last for all eternity. And that's what Paul did. To Timothy. And Timothy was faithful to pass it on. And that's what God wants to do in your life. He wants you to be a disciple maker.